Okay, so this is uh, the eighth Are you and recorded? yes, I'm recording. Uh, this is the eighth and uh, final lecture of part two of the life and times of Moses Maimonides. If in the future you ever want to study the guide, we can always go back and study the guide. Um, uh, today we're going to look at the last section of the Seder uh, Shoftim, uh, the uh, the book of Judges, book four, uh, book fourteen, the laws of kings and their wars. And the last two chapters of the Mishnah Torah are com uh, completely concerned with the concept of the Messiah. Now, the, the reason why they're put in this chapter, <clears throat> you can see both uh, technical and uh, theological reasons why he ends with this. He has begun the Mishnah Torah theologically with proofs for the existence of God, our connection, what God you know, is or is not like. Um, and so he starts with uh, creation. He, uh, you might say, he deals with uh, revelation throughout the revelation of the Torah by explicating the commandments. And now he's dealing with the third classical category of what is referred to as providence or divine action, meaning the relationship of God to the world, namely redemption, or as more technically called, eschatology. And the connection with the idea of the kings is, of course, is that the Messiah is going to be a king, a restored Davidic monarchy. And what's also important is a restored uh, Jewish sovereignty. This is very important for Maimonides, um, that he firmly believed that the messianic, the chief characteristic of the messianic era was the reestablishment of Jewish self-determination in the land of Israel. You could maybe call him a proto-Zionist on some level, uh, but it's not going to happen. Um, well, it's interesting. We'll see how it happens. So before we actually look at the material, I thought what I, I sent you was some material on the concept of the Messiah, and I thought we would take uh, some time uh, to look at this, we're not going to go through it uh, every text, So, but I want you to sort of understand where he's coming from in terms of the concept of the Messiah. Because don't forget, he's living in the 12th century, and by this time you've got uh, more than, uh, you've got about almost 2,000 years worth of evolution of the concept of the Messiah in the Jewish tradition. So first of all, um, uh, this is part of what I said, eschatology. Uh, which is, of course, theology uh, believed to be the final events of history or the ultimate destiny of humanity. It's often referred to as the end of the world or end time. In rabbinic literature, it's often referred to as the end of days uh, or the days of the Messiah. Um, it's, th there's, there's another term, olam haba, the next world, but that usually refers to what happens to a person after death. And here, uh, the ca classic categories of Jewish eschatology are threefold. Number one, the individual. What happens to me after I die? And this is where you get into the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead and the survival of the soul um, after death. So, um, hi, come on in. Did, did you guys get the material I sent out yesterday? No, I didn't. All right, here we are. Uh, we're talking about uh, general uh, ideas about the concept of the Messiah in uh, Judaism before we delve into Maimonides' Uh, notion of the Messiah. So, the three classical categories of Jewish eschatology, first of all, are individual. What happens to me after I die? All right? Uh, the second one is the national. What is the ultimate fate of the Jewish people? Is it a return to Zion, the rebuilding of the temple, the reestablishment of the Davidic kingship? This is the eschatology of the national aspect uh, of, in Judaism. And lastly, there's the universal. What will happen to the world in general? Will the world be transformed to have universal peace and justice? Will the world return to an Edenic state? In other words, back to the way life was in the Garden of Eden, in the relationships between human and nature. Will there be, with the resurrection of the dead, the end of death? Right? Um, I might add, is this going to be a supernatural process or a natural process? And one could say that for, you know, B and C, both of those, are, is it going to happen supernaturally or naturally? Also, will the, the figure of the Messiah be a semi-divine character 
or a fully human character. These are all issues. Now, um, what Maimonides is living, when he's living at his day, the concept of the Messiah has well established in rabbinic Judaism. Who the Messiah exactly was and how the Messianic era was to come about was not well established. There is no single set opinion. I wanted to say that so you sort of keep that in the back of your mind. So let's take a look. First of all, the word Messiah in English comes from the Latin, Messias, which is borrowed from the Greek, Messias, which is an adapt adaptation of the Aramaic, Meshicha, which is a translation of the Hebrew, which is a short form for Hamelech Hamashiach, the anointed king, because Mashiach means the anointed one. Now, in Greek, it is also translated, if you want to translate it into Greek, Mashiach is Christos. That's where you get the word Christ. So the term Jesus Christ means Jesus the Messiah or Jesus the anointed king. That's, I mean, by the time of Jesus, the concept of a messianic figure was established, but not as clearly um, as we assume, as most people popularly assume. So, um, if we want to look at how this evolved, and I'm partially uh, devoting here from the Encyclopedia Judaica's article on the Messiah, the biblical part was authored by the late great uh, biblical scholar H.L. Ginsberg, who taught at Jewish Theological Seminary for many years and who I studied with for one semester. Um, first of all, what you find in some of the early prophets, like Amos, is a concept called the Day of the Lord. All right? This is um, a kind of end of days where, in other words, the end of normal human history, where God will bring judgment on the wicked and restore the moral balance of the world. And it's not going to be an, a, a nice process. It's not really supernatural in the way we understand it, right? God's power becomes manifest in the world and Israel will be, those in Israel who have not failed to live up to the covenant will be punished and um, uh, the nations of the world will be judged for their wickedness and there will be an end of the normal human history, right? So that's pre-Messianic, but it's an important idea, right? That there will come a time when things will be rebalanced back to like they were at the beginning where justice um, will prevail in the world. It's funny, th that assumes that justice, things haven't been tough enough. There hasn't been enough punishment, right? Don't you feel, don't you feel it's an assumption that Look at all these people got away with all this stuff. Exactly. Right? It's, 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 it, is a, it is a reaction to the existence of uh, the question, why do the wicked prosper? But it doesn't deal with why, do the, why are the poor punished? Why are the poor, you know? And why, yeah, no, why do the righteous suffer? I mean, well, it, is, it is, it is uh, an attempt to deal with a reality where if God is the righteous judge, um, why isn't the world governed by justice? And all it means is there is a deferred judgment. Uh, the, the, the part from Amos is, is, is really, I, I, I love the, the part from Amos where he talks about this because he claims there are people who want the day of the Lord to come because they're saying, oh, everything will be great. And he says, you, are you kidding? <laughs> it's not going to be a very nice time. Um, and he has some wonderful similes. Um, you know, the guy who runs away from a lion and gets eaten by a bear, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or the man who runs inside his house to hide from the lion or the bear and gets stung by a snake. You know, I mean, he, 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 it's a really great piece. Um, it's quite funny, actually. Um, anyway, so that's sort of the foundation of this. Then what happens is, um, then there's what Ginsburg calls stage one. Um, at the height of David's power, there appears the doctrine that the Lord had chosen David and his descendants to reign over Israel to the end of time and had also given him dominion over alien peoples. And this is the royal theology of the Davidic dynasty, right? That David is God's chosen. And in fact, in, um, uh, in the Psalm 2, the king is referred to as God's son. 
in the sense that the king is as if he is the son of God in terms of God's love and um, commitment and intimacy, right? And so the Davidic covenant is seen not, uh, unlike the, the, the God's relationship with King Saul, where Saul gets displaced when he sins, specifically God tells David that his descendants might be punished if they're, they've done things wrong, but the kingship shall never depart from the Davidic dynasty. This is really important because this sets up what will eventually be the idea that the Messiah, the King Messiah, has to be a descendant of King David. Okay? Stage three occurs after the collapse of David's empire. Um, there arose the idea that the house of David would come back as a uh, dominion. And of course, this especially becomes true after the destruction of the first temple when the Davidic dynasty is exiled to Babylon. It's not destroyed, it's exiled. The, the descendants of King David remain in Babylon for over a thousand years and are the titular head of the exilic community in uh, Babylon. So there is this idea that the, da the Davidic kingdom will be restored with a descendant of. Again, this is, not, this is all political. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a reflection again of the evolution of the, uh, the Davidic um, uh, theology, royal theology. It's nothing supernatural about it except the intervention of God. So, so what's this, the, this the special about stage three? Uh, I'm getting to stage three. That was stage two. Oh, you were talking That's two. stage two. Okay. Stage three, you have an emphasis from the per, uh, perpetuity to, of the dynasty to the qualities of the future king. In other words, he's not just going to be any king. He will be the perfect king, mm -hmm. right? The king who... Um, and, and here you, it's in Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 11 especially, he will be the king that will be not only a descendant of King David, uh, not only reestablishing the Davidic uh, uh, dynasty, but also charismatically endowed, he will be the perfect ruler. All right? So now the figure becomes, you know, uh, something more than just an ordinary political figure. Right? Now, here's what I, I've added the, the next stages. Stage four, you find in the early Second Temple period prophets like Zechariah and in the early apocalyptic literature like um, uh, First Book of Enoch and a little later the Book of Daniel, um, you br have this notion that the end of time, uh, of the end of time and a messianic age. It's less focused on a figure as the age. And here's where you start to get really supernatural elements coming into it, that the natural world will be altered from its normal uh, course of things. Uh, and by the way, there's a tinge of this in Isaiah 11, where not only do you end up with the perfect king, but the whole relationship of uh, nature to one another will be altered back to the Edenic state. There will no longer be predators. Humans will not be afraid of vicious animals anymore. So this something has already been evolving, right? And what you, um, they don't necessarily focus on a human king. Sometimes the, the being that will bring this about is an angelic figure. Like in Daniel, it's the archangel Michael who is going to do this. Sometimes, as you find in um, uh, Zechariah, I shouldn't say Quran, it should be Qumran, uh, um, you have multiple figures, a king, a priest. In Zechariah, it's a king and a priest, sometimes a prophet, not always Davidic, right? So you have to see that in addition to the royal theology of the Davidic uh, idea, there's also develops this idea that it isn't necessarily going to be Davidic, and it isn't necessarily going to be a king, but there will be a final age. And so you can see the influence of the idea of the day of the Lord here, right? Yeah. Were there two traditions that, that the, the descendants of Joseph also had some kind of a... No, that comes much later. 
That comes later. What we're in, in Zechariah, it's Zerubbabel, who is the governor of Judea under the Persians, who himself is a descendant of the Davidic uh, king. He is part of the royal line. And the high priest Joshua. They are seen as two messianic figures in the prophecies of Zechariah. Okay? But they're prime kind of... That's mostly, later. That's later. Later, like, like when they... Uh, rabbinic sources. Okay? Stage five you find Davidic eschatological figures appear in apocalyptic literature, such as the Sibylline Oracles, probably in reaction to the Hasmonean king, Aristobulus I, who was the first of the Hasmoneans to formally take the title of king. So there was a reaction against it because there were many who felt that this was highly improper and illegitimate, that only a descendant of King David could become the king of Judea. And the Hasmoneans were not descendants of King David. They were priestly, uh, a priestly clan, but they were not descendants of King David. So, um, so you see in the second century BCE, in the uh, late second century BCE, you begin to see the emergence of the notion that the Messiah has to be a descendant of King David. Okay? Um, there's also, it may be influenced in the next century by the occupation of Judea right, the Roman occupation of Judea, that there is a wish for the return of the Davidic kingdom where the Jews will govern themselves. That even though they have had self-government under the Hasmoneans, they have now lost it again under the Romans. I mean, for a hundred years, they were ruling themselves finally, and that, of course, was important to them, And but for some, even if the Hasmonean king was an illegitimate king, nonetheless, the Jews had self-government and sovereignty over their own temple. When the Romans take over, when Pompey invades and, and puts Judea as under a Roman control, even when Herod is appointed as a vassal king, the many people see this as a, a terrible tragedy in terms of uh, Jewish involvement. The last stage... Um, is uh, stage six of what I'm calling is the rabbinic sources synthesize much of what came before. You find in some rabbinic sources two messiahs, what's called Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Ephraim, or ben Yosef. And Mashiach ben Ephraim is going to be killed in battle, in the eschatological battles. And what happens is that there is an age of universal peace, a return to Zion, a rebuilding of the temple, and a human king descended from David. Um, there are many supernatural, apocalyptic themes are incorporated. Some of them are more naturalistic. In other words, the problem with rabbinic sources is there's a huge amount of material, um, relatively speaking, although it actually is a tiny percentage of rabbinic literature. There is a, a large amount of material talking about the Messiah, what the Messiah is like, what the Messiah... And, and there's no unified opinion on this, right? Like there's one, uh, you know, there's the idea that it's going to be a highly terrible time with wars, what they call the Chavle Leda, the birth pangs of the age of the Messiah will be like a woman in labor who is in pain. There will be these terrible things that will happen. That's the apocalyptic thing. There's others that are saying, no, it's not going to be so bad, you know? Um, and the figure of the Messiah. There are many Midrashim and Agadot about the figure of the Messiah, that the Messiah is born into every generation and he's just waiting for the right things. But there's no unified doctrine under the rabbis. Yes, Robert? The rabbinical analysis took place in Babylon? No, the rabbinical analysis emerges out of the Bar Kokhba revolt. You see, Bar Kokhba, in the early part of the second century, claimed to be the Messiah even though he was not a descendant of David. Now, with the disastrous failure of the two revolts, some believe that rabbinic Judaism puts the rabbinic age into the indefinite future, tries to downplay the immediacy because they didn't want the Jewish community to revolt again. So in the centuries between the evolution of rabbinic Judaism, Maimonides, by the way, there were numerous times that we know of where people came forward and claimed to be the Messiah in various Jewish communities, causing a certain amount of um, disruption, including actual revolts against the local authorities. In Maimonides' own day, 
um, after he wrote the Mishnah Torah, by the way, there was such a messianic pretender in Yemen, and the Yemenite Jews wrote uh, Maimonides to ask about how do we know when the age of the Messiah is going to be? How do we know what the Messiah is going to be like? And in the process of the letter, which is quite long, um, which is in your book, by the way, if you want to read it, he also talks about um, he heard from his father and from his teachers about messianic pretenders in uh, Spain in Who, earlier generation. That? Maimonides. Maimonides says that yeah, in he, his response. He talks about uh, a number of figures that he's heard of um, uh, pre in previous years who claimed to be uh, the Messiah and how terrible, you know, they weren't, obviously. And one of the things, of course, that becomes very critical in Maimonides' own day is the calculation of when the Messianic Age is going to occur because not in the 13th century um, was the Jewish calendar was coming up to the year 5,000. And for many Jews, that was a crit going to be the when the Messiah was going to come. Of course, it didn't happen. But uh, Maimonides warns, brings up all this rabbinic material in the letter to Yemen, warning about trying to calculate the end, although they, he kind of mentions he has his own family tradition, by the way, about when the end is coming. But he warns against this kind of speculation. So, um, as you will see, Maimonides is bucking a very large tradition in his approach to the Messiah um, because he tries to create it as a almost completely naturalistic process. Now, if we want to truly understand what the rabbinic doctrine of the Messiah is, is to go to the liturgy. Okay? In other words, you've got all these rabbinic sources about the Messiah. None of them are what we would call um, absolutely authoritative. So what is the one text that becomes authoritative in trying to understand what the rabbis thought about many things? The liturgy. Because once it gets incorporated into the liturgy, everybody is saying it, and therefore it becomes a kind of credo. So, where is this mostly in? It's in the Amida, the Shemona Esrei, right? Which is uh, comes to its final form in the second century CE. So, it is a important rabbinic document for understanding what the rabbis felt about many things, but especially eschatology. So let's take a look. Would yes. You call this consensus, and this is the consensus. Yes, it's as close as you get to a uh, to a credo, right? Because if you're reciting it three times a day, mm -hmm. you know it's an expression of some of significant faith ideas, right? Um, the, the person that I learned this, I, this concept from was my teacher, Rabbi Neil Gilman, who says, you know, this is the one place we can go to really say this is what the rabbis thought. And the Amida was developed in the second century? Yeah, it has its roots in the first century CE, but its final form really, uh, the end of the first century, beginning of the second century, pretty much, um, not, even if the text is not completely fixed, the basic structure and the basic series of blessings are firmly set by the early part of the second century. Okay, so it becomes, for the rabbinic movement, the, what, I, what I will call the core liturgy, which is the Shema and the Amida. Those are the two core elements of the liturgy and the blessings before and after the Shema. Those are the critical elements of the rabbinic liturgy um, uh, that are fixed. Okay? Um, Okay, so if you take a look at the, uh, the Amida, you find uh, several of the blessings uh, are devoted to eschatological themes. The first one is the second blessing, which is called Gvurot, which means the power of God. And the word Gvura in rabbinic understanding um, was actually a rabbinic version of the Greek idea of energy, potential energy, or animation, right? So when God expresses God's gavura, how does God ultimately express God's power in the sense of energy, so to speak? By the resurrection of the dead. So in the gavurot is the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, which has its roots back into 
uh, the Second Temple period, um, maybe even late First Temple period. And as Neil Gilman points out, if you count up how many times in this paragraph it's mentioned, it's six times. Jibu Road? Well, the concept of resurrection of the dead. It's mostly triatamaitim, right? Brings life to the dead, right? If you mention something six times, you're really trying to emphasize it. And for the rabbis, it was uh, being the descendants of the Pharisees. For them, it was an essential doctrine that distinguished them from the Sadducees, for example, who didn't believe in resurrection of the dead. So if you take a look, um, you will see it, it, it starts off with it. Um, it talks about sustaining life, giving life to the dead. That's twice. Supporting the fallen, healing, freeing the captive, and keeping faith with sleepers in the dust. That phrase actually comes out of Daniel. Um, that's three. Um, then the next phrase is four. Causes salvation to flourish. Give life to the dead. That's five. Blessed are you who gives life to the dead. Now, uh, many uh, modern translations are not so literal. Um, uh, this is taken from the, uh, my, the, my People's uh, Prayer Book, uh, edited by Rabbi Lawrence Hoffman. The translation there by Joel Hoffman is, is really good. Um, the worst translation of this is in the Art Scroll, where it translates Michaia Metim as resuscitates the dead, like giving them CPR. Uh, in the conservative liturgy, um, it says usually something like master of life and death which to me is a way, is what I call the theological fudge. You don't want to change the Hebrew, so you fudge the English translation. What the Reform and Reconstructionist movement did was to eliminate Michaye Hametim and change it literally to who brings life, uh, brings, uh, causes all life to flourish or something like that. In other words, removes the idea. It's an option now. Now, yes, it returned to be an option. And you know, it was because of Neil Gilman that the Reform movement did that. Really? Because he went around giving lectures to reform rabbis saying, you know, you don't have to take it literally. It's a very important symbol. So they put it back as an option because of his influence, interestingly enough. Okay, so that's number two. So that's the personal um, uh, eschatology, right? So resurrection of the dead is a critical idea of rabbinic eschatology. Number 12 is the returning of the exiles to the land of Israel, right? Kibbutz Galuyot. That? Number 10. Oh, okay. 12. No, I said, did I say 12? I meant yeah. 10. That's blessing. That, remember, there's 19 blessings. So I'm only giving the ones okay. that are important. There is, by the way, an earlier blessing that has a general blessing for redemption, uh, but that could mean, you know, all kinds of things. I'm trying to just be the ones that are specific. Then, blessing number 14, Bonet Yerushalayim, is the rebuilding of Jerusalem into an eternal structure, and quickly David's throne within it. So the rebuilding of Jerusalem means the Jerusalem goes back. Uh, don't forget, in the rabbis' days, at the end, in the early 2nd century, Jerusalem had been virtually destroyed um, by the wars, and the Romans had turned it into a Roman city and had even renamed it and built a temple to Jupiter on the site of Solomon's temple. So it was completely changed, and so the rabbis are calling it to be rebuilt as the capital of the Jewish people and the Davidic kingdom. What are the Romans called? They called it Aeolina uh, Capitolina. Aeolina. Capitolina. Okay. Number 15, Birkat David, is specifically about the return of the Davidic monarchy, uh, meaning... Um, the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Melech HaMashiach, the anointed king. Okay? And number 17 is about the return of the sacrificial system, which, of course, was in abeyance when this was written and had been for 40, 50, 60, 70 years whenever this was composed. In fact, it was one of the reasons why the Bar Kokhba revolt broke out when it did, because it was coming up on 70 years after the destruction of the Second Temple, and the first exile lasted 70 years when the Second Temple was built. So one of the things was, it's going to happen again after 70 years. Seven, the number 70 uh, came out of the prophet Jeremiah. So here you have it. 
these uh, one, two, three, four, five blessings are recited by Jews, rabbinic Jews, from the second century onward, and then eventually rabbinic Judaism becomes what we call Judaism for the vast majority of Jews. They're recited three times a day. So this is what Maimonides, this by the day, time of Maimonides is doctrine. And in fact, in his 13 principles of faith, one of them is the coming of the Messiah, that we have to believe that the Messiah will return. That is an essential doctrine, uh, uh, or the Messiah will come, the essential doctrine of rabbinic Judaism. If you didn't believe that, you could be excommunicated. Along with resurrection of the dead, by the way, was also a central idea. Yes, Has Sam. The concept of return of sacrificial system. Yeah. Been maintained. It, I mean, in the Orthodox uh, liturgy, yes, it's still there. It's been cut out of the conservative and reform and reconstructionist liturgy. This blessing ends up becoming only about prayer. Um, there has been a move in the conservative movement to return. Um, when the prayer book is, a uh, uh, new prayer book is edited to return the mention of the sacrifices. Again, the argument is we accept this symbolically rather than literally. I, I'm not in favor of it personally, mm -hmm. but, okay, yeah. Right, isn't it in the prayer book it says optional? Uh, there, there's a part of the Musaf for Shabbat. There is a, um, the conservative movement has downplayed the sacrifices in the Musaf, uh, one of which by supplying an optional paragraph to those who don't want to mention it at all. What happened was, is in the Silverman Sidur in the 1950s, Rabbi Robert Gordas wrote a paragraph to replace the traditional one, um, which talks about the sacrifices only in the past and not their restoration. That has been the standard, pretty much standard in the conservative, but the, the Sim Shalom gave you an option to eliminate it at all, okay? So, there it is. This is what Maimonides is dealing with, okay? And in his own day, there is messianic tension in Yemen and in other places, um, and he is now trying to incorporate this within his own structure, and he actually makes some very interesting and radical changes to much of what we have been talking about. So let's begin. We're on page 222. This is chapter 11 of uh, the book of these. Uh, chapter 11 and 12 are the last chapters of the Mishnah Torah. So, um, Suzanne, do you want to read? On, it's on page 222 where it says, King, King Messiah. Messiah. King Messiah will arise and restore the kingdom of David to its former state and original sovereignty. He will rebuild the sanctuary and gather the dispersed of Israel. All the ancient laws will be reinstituted in his days. Sacrifices will again be offered. The sabbatical and jubilee years will again be observed in accordance with the commandments set forth in the law. So far, pretty straightforward. This is what's going to happen, right? Rebuild the sanctuary, um, restore the kingdom of Jerusalem, um, gather the dispersed. So far, pretty straightforward. Read on. He who does not believe in a restoration or does not look forward to the coming of the Messiah denies not only the teachings of the prophets, but also those of the law of Moses, our teacher. For scripture affirms the rehabilitation of Israel, as it is said, then the Lord your God will turn your captivity and have compassion upon you and will return and gather you. If any of yours that are dispersed be in the uttermost parts of heaven, and the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed. The rabbis find, interpret this verse from Deuteronomy as a reference to the Messianic age. It doesn't mean that. It means the Babylonian exile. But this becomes the rabbinic proof text. And then what he does is he refers to a number of other biblical verses that have been interpreted to refer to the Messiah. Um, for uh, here and in, and he talks about the two messiahs here, right? The first, namely David, meaning if you if the if the word messiah means the anointed king, the first Mashiach technically was David himself, right? And the second will be a a literal 
physical descendant of David, he says, who will achieve the final salvation of Israel. And then he quotes from the prophecy of Balaam, um, who he, again, the rabbis interpret this as referring to the future King David, because in Balaam's time there is no monarchy, right? They're still wandering in the desert, and the future Messiah. And the most important verse is the one that says, there shall step forth a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Now, what's interesting is the word star um, is therefore a symbol of the king. And the Hasmonean kings on some of their coins put a star. And Bar Kokhba, his real name was Bar Kosiba. He was known as Bar Kokhba. Kokhba means star. Okay, so this word star becomes the symbol of the Messiah. All right, so he again, he's quoting a whole bunch of biblical verses that have been interpreted not just by the rabbis, but even many of them previous to the rabbis. I mean, if you look at Christian interpretations of these verses, they will say these refer to Jesus, right? And if Jesus is the Messiah, therefore, th so these are verses which have in later uh, Second Temple Judaism were interpreted to refer to the coming of the Messiah, right? Well, Cock, does that have anything to do with the revolution? What revolution? Bar Kokhba? Bar Kokhba? Yeah. Uh, no, Bar Kokhba is building on these interpretations. In other words, these interpretations pre-exist Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba claims to be the Messiah. It is a failure, and the rabbis, and some of the rabbis believed he was the Messiah, and then what happens after the disastrous war is the rabbis downplay the immediacy of the coming of the Messiah. Yeah. How, how were they were so successful erasing the soul tradition completely, the Benjamin tradition? It just falls out. It just in the Ephraim and Joseph one, you mean? Yeah. It just it just. But also because King Saul was the first king. Yeah, but and king, he didn't have descendants. It, but. No, but in the in the Torah in the Bible itself in the Tanakh itself, God basically says his forget it. His descendants are gone, and and the only one who's a legitimate king is but David. But that's actually the people who wrote. Of course, it comes out of the Judean theology, the Judean royal theology, right? In next, our next class, I'll be talking about that. In other words, there is a very strong stream in many biblical texts of what is called the royal theology, okay? All right, uh, let's look at number two. Go on, Suzanne. So um, with two, so ref two, with reference to the cities of refuge, the Bible says... And if the Lord your God enlarge your borders, then you shall add three cities more for you, a precept which has never been carried out. Yet, not in vain did the Holy One, blessed be he, give us the commandment. As for the prophetic utterances on the subject of the Messiah, no citations are necessary as all their books are full of this thing. So all of the references to the return of the Davidic monarchy, the day of the Lord, all that stuff has been reinterpreted within the traditional rabbinic concept of the coming of the Messiah, the resurrection of the dead, the return, all of these things, okay? So he says, well, I don't really have to explicate that because there's so many of them. Now comes a very critical point that he's going to make. Go on. Do not... Yes, yeah, sorry. What are the three cities that were used? Oh, there, there are... Um, the Torah command says in several places that when they take over the land, they're supposed to establish what are called irmik are miklat, cities of refuge, for um, accidental homicides. In other words, if you kill somebody accidentally, mm -hmm. technically speaking, um, the relatives of the dead person can kill you, but if you go to the city of refuge, they can't touch you. Okay? And, and biblically, there are three such cities. No, there's, no, more. there's more. There's a bunch of them. Okay? I that that's all. Well, the, you know, it has to do with how do you deal with uh, with accidental uh, killing. And he's correct in stating that no citations are necessary as all of the books are so full of them? Uh, you know, it's uh, exaggerating a bit. But if you started going through all, the, there's a lot of books of prophets, remember, and you start pulling out all the possible, you know, eschatological stuff, apocalyptic stuff, The there's a, yeah, there could be a ton of material there. Okay, go on. Do not think that King Messiah will have to perform signs and wonders, 
bring anything new into being, revive the dead, or do similar things. Ah, this is very interesting. He <laughs> is excluding the idea of the Messiah as a supernatural figure or a human with supernatural powers. Now, this is important for a variety of things, but this is also an implicit critique of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Go on. It is not so. Rabbi Akiva was a great sage, a teacher of the Mishnah, yet he was also the armor bearer of Ben Kozba. He affirmed that the latter was King Messiah. He and all the wise men of his generation shared this belief until Bar Kozba was slain in his iniquity, when it became known that he was not the Messiah. Not all the rabbis believed Bar Kozba was the Messiah. Uh, there's a statement in rabbinic literature that one of Akiba's colleagues said to him, Akiba, grass will be growing in the cheeks of your in the cheeks of your skull before the Messiah comes. Okay, so but what, generally they were believers. Uh, some of the most important ones, Akiva was certainly one of them, uh, accepted it. Go on. Uh, yet the rabbis had not asked him for a sign or token. Okay, he, he from the rabbinic understanding of Bar Kokhba, they did not say to him, show us a miracle. Go on. The general principle is, this law of ours with its statutes and ordinances is not subject to change. It is forever and all eternity. It is not to be added to or to be taken away from. Whoever adds aught to it or takes aught from it or misinterprets it and strips the commandments of their literal sense is an imposter, a wicked man, and a heretic. Again, this is anti-Christian, right? Mm -hmm. The Torah will not change. There is no radical change in the Torah in the Messianic age. By the way, there actually is a rabbinic tradition that there will be a radical change in the Torah, but it's a minority voice, all right? It, really, it's quite, yeah, we don't have to go into it. It's in a few, very, just a few rabbinic texts that the Torah, there's, that a lot of the prohibitions will disappear, there will only be certain, there will be no sin offerings, only Thanksgiving offerings, that all the holidays will basically disappear, except for Purim, apparently. Um, I mean... In the Messianic age. Yeah, there's a, some minor texts, which, by the way, get picked up by the Kabbalah. It, it has a very interesting history in the Kabbalistic tradition, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. But uh, my Maimonides is, you know, he's, like anybody, he's being very selective, and he, he's taking the majority opinion is the Torah is eternal, and in the Messianic age, there will be no radical changes to it, which, of course, is contrary to the Christian notion that with the coming of Jesus, the Torah, the laws of the Torah, for the most part, are up to be abolished and replaced. Right? right? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why Christians don't practice kashrut. The new, All right? new Testament. All right? New Testament. Jesus. In other words, you don't need to follow the law. This is Paul, by the way, primarily. Um, uh, uh, St. Paul, basically Paul of Tarsus, he develops the idea that uh, belief in Jesus, and again, he radically changes what the concept, not radically, he evolves the concept of the Messiah in a very different direction. Uh, you no longer need to, to follow the law if you are not ethnically Jewish um, to be a to achieve salvation. Mm -hmm. So what that ends up being in later Christianity is the law is abolished. And yet they do study the, the Old Testament. Yes, but they, they, they don't, them. they only selectively, most of the laws of Leviticus, I mean, they accept certain of it, but most of what we consider to be the ritual commandments, the concept of all the impurity laws go, the kashrut laws, um, the whole idea of wanting the temple to be rebuilt. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that, that Christianity completely um, gets rid of. And by the way, I was actually thinking about it um, this morning for some reason. Um, this is shown pictorially in many um, medieval Christian, uh, both on a statuary and also stained glass windows in churches, showing the figure of synagoga and, ecle and ecclesia. Ecclesia is a woman holding a, a, a sword or a, a spear, standing proud and victorious. And synagoga is a figure of a woman who is blindfolded, dejected, dejected with a broken spear. Mm. Right? Ecclesia is victorious over synagoga. The 
Christian idea of a uh, relationship with God, the Jews no longer are in covenant with God. Okay? All right. I just have a question about three yeah. in the very beginning. Does this mean that uh, Maimonides does not believe in the revival of the dead? No, he does, but the Messiah will not bring it about. Oh. In other words, Jesus resurrected Lazarus, mm -hmm. right? So n the Messiah will do none of the miracles that are ascribed to Jesus. Remember, Jesus healed people. He, you know, he walked across the water. He turned the water into rye wine. There was the loaves and fishes at the at the wedding of Cana. Mm -hmm. um, he revived Lazarus from the dead. No, that's the Messiah will do none of those things. So how will the resurrection take place? By God, only by God. What's fascinating in is, of course, is that uh, Maimonides himself probably had problems with the concept of the resurrection of the dead because it was profoundly unnatural, and he doesn't even mention it in as part of the messianic age and he had to defend himself throughout his life about attacks that he did not believe in it so he, what about the animami in the tree, the... he put it in his 13 principles but if you look at it, it's not mentioned at all in the mishnah torah huh. so so the three principles the 13 principles are where where are they located they're not in the form that we have it he didn't write it that way they're in his commentary to the mishnah of the tra of the we, chapter, we yeah, yeah, it's in it's in the if you look at his commentary on the mission, which is part of the, uh, here, uh, it's um, uh, it's he he brings it out in his commentary to the Mishnah on the chapter in Tractate Saint Hendred called Hachelik, um, but he doesn't it doesn't say I firmly believe with perfect faith. That was a later uh, later recasting of his thirteen principles into a kind of a credo, which he never wrote it that way. And the Yigdal, of course, is also a version of it, but that was done by somebody, a poet in Rome, later than him. Okay? Yes, Robert? The polemic at the end, the last sentence, yeah. in parentheses, that was put in by him or that was put in by an editor? Uh, that was put in by, I think, an editor. I don't think, it, it, there, there's no parentheses in the original. He, 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 medieval Hebrew word. doesn't have parentheses. Okay. Well, but, but the parentheses were put in by an editor, or the entire sentence? No, the no, the parentheses are put in. In other words, um, uh, the trans the translate the translator thinks it's a parenthetical remark. Right. But it's in the Hebrew too, you know. What the parentheses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's that's by a, a printer or an editor. I'm sure in the original manuscript he didn't do it because, as far as I know, in, in medieval Hebrew never used the parentheses. So so let, let me get this clear because. This is saying the Torah is immutable. Yes. Uh, so, and my question is, did Maimonides say that, or did someone no, no, no. stick it in? No, no, no. No, no, he absolutely said it. I see. All right. Uh, Irma, you want to pick up number four? <clears throat> if there arise a king from the house of David who meditates on the Torah, occupies himself with the commandments, as did his ancestor David, observes the precepts prescribed in the written and the oral law, prevails upon Israel to walk in the way of the Torah and to impair its breaches, and fights the battles of the Lord, it may be assumed that he is the Messiah. If he does these things and succeeds, he builds the sanctuary on its site and gathers the dispersed of Israel, he is beyond all doubt the Messiah. He will prepare the whole world to serve the Lord with one accord, as it is written, for then will I turn to the peoples a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Now this is fascinating. If somebody from the house of David arises, is a pious Torah scholar, prevails upon the Jewish people to walk in the ways of Torah, fights the battles of the Lord, in other words, is a military leader, and brings about Jewish self-independence again, you may presume that he is the Messiah. And then, if he gathers the dispersed of the Jewish people and rebuilds the sanctuary, then we know he's the Messiah. It's a post facto designation. Mm -hmm. In other words, if somebody comes and claims, I am the Messiah, he's not the Messiah. It's only when somebody achieves these things that we can say that they are the Messiah. That is totally contrary to any kind of messianic movement that occurred in Judaism, both before him and after him. Usually what happens is somebody comes forward 
and either immediately claims to be the Messiah before they do anything, or they are proclaimed to be the Messiah, as happened in the 17th century with Shabtai Tzvi, the last major messianic movement in Judaism before Chabad was the Shabtai Tzvi in the 17th century. And it, by the way, it was the one in all of Jewish history that was the most successful until it failed. All right? He also claimed. He, also he claimed. was a charismatic, mystical figure who he had a prophet, in effect, his Paul, so to speak, a guy named Nathan of Gaza, who said this guy is the Messiah, and then Shabtai Tzvi himself proclaimed it. He was examined by rabbis at the time, many of whom said, yes, he is the Messiah. There were always a few doubters. And the Jewish world from London to Yemen, for the most part, believed he was the Messiah. Because there was printing, there were broadsheets that were printed, spread throughout the Jewish world. Um, you might say missionaries or emissaries. And 90% of the Jews believed he was the Messiah. Uh, in fact, we know, Jews at least, the doubters were suppressed, right? And in fact, we know from the memoirs of Gluckel of Hamlin, who was a woman who was living in, Sen in Hamburg at the time, she res relates that when she was a child, this occurred, and her father started packing up things in barrels because they were fully expecting to be moving to the land of Israel. Jews sold their property. They expected they were going to be miraculously transported. All kinds of people believed that he was the Messiah. Um, and what happened, and there's all kinds of, you know, huge number of literature as to why and why did this happen then and why did people believe him. But then, then you know, eventually the whole movement collapsed when the Ottoman uh, Sultan said, uh, convert to Islam or I'll kill you. And instead of going the route of Jesus, he <laughs> converted to Islam. And that, co Jewish fellow. <laughs> um, that collapsed the movement mostly. But a bunch of his followers went underground and said this was all part of the plan and remained his followers even after he died. It's quite, it's a, it's a very complex history. We, uh, anyway, let's take a look at number chapter 12. Irma, you want to go on? Let no one think that in the days of the Messiah, any of the laws of nature will be set aside or any innovation be introduced into creation. The world will follow its normal course. No change in the Torah, no change in nature. So then what about all the stuff in the Bible that says it's going to be changed? Listen to what he says. The words of Isaiah, and the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, are to be understood figuratively, meaning that Israel will live securely among the wicked of the heathens who are likened to wolves and leopards. As it is written, a wolf of the deserts does not spoil them. Does, does spoil them. Oh, does spoil them, I'm sorry. A leopard watches over their cities. They will all accept the true religion and will neither plunder nor destroy and together with Israel earn a comfortable living in a legitimate way as it is written and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. All similar expressions used in connection with the messianic age are metaphorical. In the days of King Messiah the full meaning of those metaphors and their allusions will become clear to all. That's how he explains it all away. And of course in the guide, a large the first whole first part of the guide is meant to talk about how much of the language in the Bible, especially when it's talking about God, is metaphorical. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's already said so, by the way, at the beginning of the Mishnah Torah about God. What he is now saying is all those prophecies about the end of the world are all metaphorical if they are unnatural. This is a radical re-reading of biblical text and a large part of the messianic tradition which is apocalyptic supernatural it's all there and he is completely getting rid of it why is he getting rid of it because in our sense he's a scientist he believes in the immutability of natural law he does not believe in what we with he only believes in one thing that is supernatural. And there we're wondering whether he had doubts, and that's the resurrection of the dead. Maimonides was, didn't believe in anything that one might call, in his context, supernatural. He would have been so, so happy nowadays. Hey, he would have struggled with a lot of the stuff that we've <laughs> discovered, but 
don't forget, rationality, the rational understanding of the natural word for him was a central spiritual activity. Does this guy Brian Green? Except he, he's an atheist, though. <laughs> no, but you know what? There was a great interview with him. I, I've I'm, seen him speak. I, I've seen him speak. He's amazing. He's amazing. Right? Yeah, he talks about wonder, but he doesn't let it go anywhere after but that, by the way. they have such a nice conversation. Yeah, they would have had a wonderful <laughs> conversation. Yeah. Who is this Brian Green? He is a, he's, one of the, uh, he's an important scientist, scientist uh, who is one of the chief proponents string of string theory. string theory. Yeah. Uh, I've heard him lecture. He's, he's a but really... He doesn't even say the theory. He says it's a hypothesis. Yes, it's because it, you can't test it. So he is a great showman, by the way. Oh, uh, if you ever get a chance to so was, go to a lecture, he puts on a great show. He, TED Talks. Just there's a TED Talk. Yeah, there's a TED Talk. But I saw him live at Chautauqua last uh, summer. Anyway, okay. So this is really important. So, so his concept, so the money's concept of the Messiah... A human being who will die. Fully eventually. human being who will be an earthly king who will bring about political mm -hmm. self-determination and independence of the Jewish people and help to bring peace and justice to the rest of the world. But of course then he's going to die. And yeah. What happens then? Then his son takes over and then we continue. Right? Right? It's, it's got a lot more plausibility. There's no end of time for Maimonides. Right. Because he's living in an Aristotelian universe, which is eternal. Now, the big problem for him and other Jewish philosophers was, you know, Aristotle did not posit a creation. So how do you accept Aristotelian science and Aristotelian astronomy, but not accept the Aristotelian notion of the eternity of the universe because it conflicts with biblical ideas and Jewish ideas? So that's where, in the guide, there is a whole section of the guide devoted to grappling with the theories of creation. And he also deals with the Platonic notion of creation, which he ultimately kind of accepts the Platonic notion. All right? Did you say we're going to study a little bit of the guide? Uh, well, we're, we're not going to get to the guide. Again, if we want to do the guide, we'll do a whole different course on the guide. Uh, but it sounds like everybody wanted to take a break. Of my, my okay. The next 15 minutes we're going to do. Yeah, exactly. All right, so, um, George, you want to pick up number two here. This is important. Said the rabbis, uh, the sole difference between the present and the messianic days is delivery from servitude to foreign powers. To take the words of the prophets in their literal sense, it appears that the inauguration of the Messianic era will be marked by the war of Gog and Magog, that prior to that war, a prophet will arise to guide Israel and set the hearts aright. As it is written, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. He, Elijah, will come neither to declare the clean unclean nor the unclean clean, neither to disqualify those who are presumed to be of legitimate descent, nor to pronounce qualified those who are presumed to be of illegitimate descent, but to bring peace to the world, as it is said, and sh he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Okay, so he's bringing, he's talking about, people will have said, wait a minute, Maimonides, what about this rabbinic stuff about these apocalyptic wars of Gog and Magog, which comes out of the book of Ezekiel? What about the return of Elijah, you know? What about all this stuff? So first of all, he, he, so he's confronting it, right? Because he's just said, hey, this is going to be a completely natural process, right? I mean, there could be a lot, and by the way, a lot of people didn't like what he was saying here. A lot of rabbinic authorities were really... This is what, this what, he, well, to this very day, I mean, but in his own day, there were people who declared he was a heretic because of this. This okay? is nearly dramatic and different and, and, and kind of uh, uh, theoretical enough for them. They wanted something wild, the end of days. They for them, they believed in the, what I would say is the majority of the, of the messianic traditions that says it's going to be a period of uh, great upheaval and war and supernatural divine intervention, right? And of course, that's what the Christians also believed and the Muslims believed, right? Go on, some of our sages. Some of our sages say that the coming of Elijah will precede the advent of the Messiah, but no one is in a position to know the details of this and similar things until they have come to pass. They are not explicitly stated by the prophets, nor have the rabbis any tradition with regard to these matters. They are guided solely by what the scriptural texts seem to imply. Hence, there is a divergence of opinion on this subject. But, be that as it may, neither the exact sequence of, these, of those events, 
nor the details thereof constitute religious dogma. In other words, the rabbis have all kinds of opinion about when the Messiah, what will happen is he's saying, okay, this is not dogma. This is not an essential idea of Judaism, right? The coming of the Messiah is the nature of the Messiah, the way the Messiah comes, the pure... He says, that is not dogma. And then read on. He's got something very interesting. Yeah. No one should ever occupy himself with the legendary themes or spend much time on the Midrashic statements bearing on this and like subjects. He should not deem them of prime importance since they lead neither to the fear of God nor the love of him, nor should one calculate the end. Said the rabbis, blasted be those who reckon with, who reckon out the end. One should wait for his coming and accept in principle this article of faith as we have stated before. And that's he's referring to. So in other words, he says, don't waste your time on this. And that's, by the way, if you read the, the, the letter to Yemen, a lot of what that is is don't waste your time trying to calculate when the Messiah comes. It's useless. And in fact, by quoting this rabbinic thing, he's saying the rabbis were against it. What's interesting is he did have a family tradition about when the end was coming. <laughs> he did. Uh, it was a few years after he died, actually, interestingly enough. It was in the early 13th century, so it obviously didn't happen. All right, read the next one. In the days of King Messiah, when his kingdom will be established and all Israel will gather around him, their pedigree will be determined by him through the Holy Spirit, which will rest upon him, as it is written, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier. First he will purify the descendants of Levi, declaring this one of good birth is a priest, this one of good birth is a Levite. Those who are, those who are not of good birth will be demoted to the rank of lay Israelites, for it is written... You don't have to read the next verse. Go on. Okay. It is inferred... It is inferred therefrom that the genealogy of those considered to be of good lineage will be traced by means of the Holy Spirit. And those found to be of good birth will be made known. The descent of Israelites will be recorded according to their tribes. He will announce, this one is of such and such a tribe, this one of such and such a tribe. But he will not say concerning those who are presumed to be of pure descent, who are presumed to be of pure descent, this is a bastard, this is a slave. I don't understand what I'll, get, I'll explain it. For, for, the the rule, for the rule is, once a family has been intermingled with others, it retains its status. He's dealing here with a very practical concern. If the temple is rebuilt, we have to know who, in fact, are Kohanim and who are Levi'im. Right? Because even in the Middle Ages, they knew that people who were uh, presumed, uh, who were Levites and, and Kohanim in their own day, that they were all of doubtful status because in the temple they apparently kept these great genealogical records and they were all destroyed with the destruction of the temple. And as a result, you you know said you were a Kohen, you were said you were a Levi if your father said it, but there's no absolute certainty that anybody is. And of course, we don't have that genetic, they didn't have that genetic test that the people claim. Could, and so as a result, one of the tasks that the Mashiach will do in order to rebuild the temple and get the service done properly, he has to determine who is really a Levite and who is really a Kohen. And by the way, because the Kohanim were of doubtful status, that's why in the Middle Ages, they were, according to the rabbis, they were allowed to be doctors. Because a doctor might come in contact with a dead body. And Kohanim are not supposed to be in contact with dead bodies, but because all Kohanim's status was doubtful, a Kohen could become a doctor. Interesting. But they still couldn't enter a cemetery? Yeah, they still did these other things, but they, they felt that saving a life was more important than adhering to those rules when it came to a medicine. So if they had a, if they, you know, had an a application to become a doctor, they, that was fine. Okay. All right. The, the last sentence. The yeah. Rule is once families have been intermingled with the others, it retains its status. In other words, does that mean once a Cohen, always a Cohen? Yes. Once intermingled, never again. A no. Cohen. Once a co if you're if you're a descendant of Cohen, it doesn't matter if um, in the days of the Messiah. In the days of Messiah, whether there have been people who were descendants of slaves who married into the family, or people who were descendants of Mamzerim, which are not illegitimate by our standards, but people who were the product of incest or uh, adultery, there could be Mamzerim who were intermingled in your family. You don't have to worry about that anymore. It's all cleaned up. It's all cleaned up, exactly, right? This, the, the term, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Ruach HaKodesh. Yeah. That, it's a direct translation from the Hebrew. Of what? Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh. 
meaning that once the king is established, then in effect, there will be a revelatory means. The Urim and the Tumim will return, and there will be, because Maimonides does believe in revelation, um, there will be a revelatory man. He doesn't see this, by the way, as unnatural or supernatural. He sees this as connecting up with the natural uh, uh, revelatory power of God. Uh, so there will be a way, uh, we would call it supernatural or chance, but uh, there will be a way through the Urim and Tumim that will be restored to figure out who's prop really Kohanim or Leviim. Well, but I think, he, I thought he was saying that that won't matter because any blemish on their genealogical record will be... No, but you have to establish who really are still a Kohen, right? In other words, somebody comes up and says, I'm a Kohen, maybe they're not really a Kohen. When the temple gets rebuilt, you really have to know. I mean, even in our own day, people whose last name is Cohen isn't necessarily mean they're Kohanim. And as we know, there are a lot of people who are Kohanim that don't have the last name Cohen. I mean, there are certain family names that are Kohanic names, not only Cohen, but um, uh, um, a Siegel, um, a Segal HaKohen, that comes from Segal HaKohanim, um, and Katz, it means Kohen Tzedek, that comes from the Hebrew. What well, the um, names that sound like Cohen, like Coben? Uh, not necessarily, not necessarily, okay? Uh, I'll tell you a story, a friend of ours, uh, her father uh, was a, 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 a literary a critic named Nathan Cohen in Canada. Um, and his family, how did they get the name Cohen? When his father came to the immigration, the guy couldn't pronounce his real name and said all Jews are named Cohen and wrote down Cohen. So Nathan Cohen was when not a Cohen. And when the Messiah comes, that will all be... <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yes. I had an uncle who was, last name was Cohen, but his real... It got changed to Ellis Isle. Right. And he switched his name to Robinson. <laughs> right. And, and, and either his mother's last name or what he thought his father's last name. Because he didn't want to have such a Jewish name. Family. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have a cousin whose last name is Schiff, and they are Kohanim. And, and their original name. Um, is their their name shift was a was a was a change from their original name, but their original name had nothing to do with co being a coin. So, well, because it was passed down from father to son, right? They knew they. Were. Well, my son in law, my son in law, who I get, you know, who is the father of my newborn grandson, his last name is Friedenreich. They're Kohanim, right? So I have a grandson now who's a Kohen, okay. My uh, father-in-law was a Kohen. His last name was Kahn. Now, Kahn doesn't come from Cohen. It sounds a little like it, but it's a German word for an old barge. <laughs> <laughs> but many Kahns are Kohanim, not all of them. Okay. Um, read on. The sages and prophets. Go ahead. I passed the torch. Okay, Robert. <laughs> the sages and prophets did not long for the days of the Messiah that Israel might exercise dominion over the world, or rule over the heathens, or be exalted by the nations, or they might eat and drink and rejoice. Their aspiration was that Israel be free to devote itself to the law and its wisdom, with no one to oppress or disturb it, and thus be worthy of life in the world. In other words, the coming of the Messiah will not mean that the Jewish people will become the rulers of humanity which some messianic visions claim will happen. He's saying, no, all we want to do is to be left alone, to rule ourselves, to develop our own wisdom, our own spirituality, not be oppressed, because for Maimonides, a political peace is necessary for the proper evolution of religion and faith. Right? It's very interesting. Previously, he said that the the leopard will lie down, so the, that Israel will live in peace among these other people who exactly. are not, presumably not in a messianic age themselves, or maybe they they're just what they used to be, but they're not vicious anymore. Right, exactly. And the point is, is that Maimonides was living in a time of warfare, the Crusades, where there were, uh, you know, the he himself, his family had been chased out of Spain by fanatical Muslims. I mean. Um, you know, he was living in a world where warfare was the common state of the world, that every spring the kings would go out to fight their wars, right? 
And what he says is, is that the Messianic age is a time when there, it, this doesn't exist anymore. And in those, because he believes that you cannot develop a proper, you cannot develop philosophers, first of all, in a situation where there is war and famine and all these kinds of things. And he, he sees that most of the ills of the world actually comes from human um, uh, uh, violence, not natural uh, 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 events. And by the way, I think he's right. Okay? Okay, read the next one, five. In that era, there will be neither famine nor war, neither jealousy nor strife. Blessing will be abundant, comforts within the reach of all. The one preoccupation of the whole world will be to know the Lord. Hence, Israelites will be very wise. They will know the things that are now concealed and will attain an understanding of their creator to the utmost com capacity of the human mind as it is written, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. He takes a messianic prophecy from one of the most messianic chapters of the Bible, chapter 11 of Isaiah. That's the one with the lion and the lamb and the perfect king and all that stuff, a Davidic descendant. And in effect, he says, um, that's what the messianic age will be. And in fact, he has now come full circle. What does he say at the beginning? What is the most important thing that one can do? is try to gain knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? You study the natural world, you study the Torah, you think, you know, you analyze. For him, it, that's his spiritual thing. And the guide, of course, goes into this in great detail, especially at the end of the guide. It becomes a kind of philosophical mysticism. But in order to do that, you have to have a world that is free from strife. And he believes, by the way, that most famines are human-caused because of warfare, right, and other things. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he's bringing himself completely back to the beginning. Uh, in the original text, he actually ends with a, with a little bit of a poem. Um, and uh, and his, so his vision of the, the age of the Messiah, and notice here again, he has not mentioned the resurrection of the dead. In traditional rabbinic ideas, the Messiah will come and then the dead will be resurrected at some point. When you look at his concept of the resurrection of the dead, he has to accept it because otherwise he is a heretic. But what does he say? In most rabbinic ideas is that once the dead are resurrected, that's the end of death, right? A completely unnatural and supernatural event. In his notion of the resurrection of the dead, if you look at his other texts on it, the dead get resurrected and then they live out their lives again and die. For him, the true ultimate spiritual reward comes after death when your soul, if you have properly trained it during your lifetime, will come as close to the presence of God as possible. He has this whole parable in the Guide for the Perplexed um, of a palace and a city, uh, a, a palace inside a city, and the palace where the king lives, and all the different people who are trying to get into the city and getting in to see the king, and he classifies people According, you know, he says the people who follow the Torah but don't do any philosophy are the people who, you know, wander around the walls but don't know how to get in. Right? The true philosopher gets in to see the king. So for him, the only way this is going to happen is in a world where there is no war and therefore no famine. Uh, there is justice. It's a completely naturalistic view of the messianic age. And the Messiah is not a supernatural figure. He's not recognized at the time he arises, but rather he's post facto to claim to be the Messiah. This is counter to, to many of the apocalyptic ideas. It's counter to Christianity. Um, and it's one that modern Jews have found rather attractive. When you look at modern uh, Jewish theology on the concept of the Messiah, you will find especially in the reform movement and the liberal parts of the conservative movement, it moves away from the figure of the Messiah and talks about the Messianic age, sometimes not to be taken literally at all, but, all, but to be taken as a symbol that constantly moves us towards a better future. And I think the, this naturalistic concept, the Messiah, has been, in the modern sense, has been influenced by Maimonides, right? Yes, Robert. 
You, you made a statement that he feels that famine is a consequence of war. Is that yeah. your interpretation? Because it doesn't say that here. I know. I, it, it's, it says, if you look in the guide when he deals with evil, he really says that, you know, he, he, he right. classifies most of what he, first of all, he says most of what people consider evil has nothing to do with evil. Mm -hmm. Evil, uh, things like um, uh, earthquakes and things like, they're all natural events. And uh, even getting old and getting sick and dying, he says, that's the consequence of us being material beings made of flesh and blood that will waste away eventually. He then goes to talk about interpersonal relationships as, and, and, uh, as being uh, the, really where evil Ill dwells and ultimately says evil actually results not as some ben a malignant separate force in the universe, which he's against demons after all, it comes out of you. You, by your improper opinions and lack of understanding of how you're supposed to live your life, that's where evil gets generated because then you're going to mistreat other people. So the only thing in him that is evil comes out of the human, uh, out of human activity and lack of human development. It, it's just that he, he has accepted that an earthquake is a natural event. Yes, but war, as he knew, was one of the main causes of human suffering and most likely to cause things like famine because what do armies do when they march through a territory? They destroy the sources of food of, the, of their enemies. I mean, yeah, there could be natural famines, absolutely, but, he believed, but then again, if you had a good society, you would deal with that by distribution and dealing with it it, war causes famine, right? So uh, he would not consider Revelation a messiah. Absolutely not. Oh, I, I, you, we didn't actually read it, but I thought that your analysis about who would be the messiah was a post facto analysis of all the good he had done. It's, it's Schneerson didn't achieve any of that. And, and and the fact is, is that the the Chabad notion of uh, uh, of the messianic although they can't ignore Maimonides, essentially is um, a kind of supernaturalist approach. When you look at those today who don't believe that Schneerson really died, he's kind of in a sort of suspended animation state. I mean, it's all supernaturalism when you really get down to it. Rabbi Nachman too, no? The whole... uh, Nachman never claimed to be the Messiah. But his disciples, no? No, no. They, they thought he maybe he was a prophet, but I don't think but they, they say, saw him as the Messiah. Now, before we conclude, I want to look at the part that was censored out of the manus about uh, of out of the Mishnah Torah, the printed versions of the Mishnah Torah by Christian censors. Okay, this is on page two twenty six. Did the Jews ever censor themselves out of fear? Yes, there was a certain amount of self censorship, um, but in in a, uh, on the basis of certain attacks, like the Elenu prayer, was censored, self censored. Self -censored. Um, this, would have been this was not self-censored. This was external. In other words, if you look at the manuscript edition, the one that Maimonides himself corrected in his own handwriting and signed his name to, this is there. If you look in the earliest printed editions of the Mishnah Torah, this is not there. And the original manuscript exists? Well, a, a copy of, the, of a manuscript from Maimonides' own life where, where he uh, signed it to say this is a good copy... And, by the way, some drafts in the, in the Cairo Geniza, um, drafts of some parts of the Mishnah Torah are found in his handwriting. Where is the, where is the one with his handwriting correcting it to school? It's in more than one place because the entire thing was, uh, it's in two libraries now, and it's not complete. It doesn't have all uh, 14 books. It has uh, two-thirds of it because the original manuscript was was passed down in the Maimonides family and then eventually sold and then broken up. Uh, most of it's in um, Cambridge. Uh, the, the second part of it ended up with the Sassoon family and is in Jerusalem. So parts of it are in Israel and parts of it are in England. And it represents about two-thirds, I believe, of the entire Mishnah Torah. So, so this is... Essentially making statements which are incompatible with Jesus being the Messiah. Yeah, well, he, this is a polemic, a direct polemic against Christianity and Islam. But, well, read but, on. But if he does not meet with full success or is slain, it is obvious that he is not the Messiah promised in the Torah. 
He is to be regarded like all the other wholehearted and worthy kings of the house of David, David who died, and whom the Holy One blessed be. He raised up to test the multitude, as it is written, and some of them that are wise shall stumble, to refine amongst them, and to purify and to make white, even to the time of the end, for it is yet for the time appointed. In other words, if a descendant of the house of David arises and tries to lead the Jews back to Israel and do it, but he fails and he's killed in the process, he's not the Messiah. He may be regarded as a worthy person. And this may be an allusion to Bar Kokhba here, um, but the point is, he's saying is, that if he's not successful, he's not Messiah. And this whole paragraph, by the way, comes at the end of chapter 11 on page 224, okay? All right, now. Even if Jesus of Nazareth, who imagined that he was the Messiah, but was put to death by the court, Daniel had prophesied, as it is written, and the children of the violent among your people shall lift themselves up to establish the vision. But they shall stumble. This is fascinating. He's saying that Jesus was prophesied in the book of Daniel as a false messiah. Now, of course, Jesus actually never called himself the messiah, but his followers either thought he was the pro a prophet or the messiah, and Paul certainly thought he was the messiah. Okay, so the point is, he's now saying Jesus wasn't even among the good guys who failed to do it. All right, go on. He was not among the good guys? No, he's not. He said he imagined he, he and he's and he's not, and he doesn't believe that Jesus was a descendant of David, despite what the Christians say, right? He doesn't say he wasn't among the good guys. Uh, he says he imagined he was the Messiah, and he was put to get by the court, meaning the Sanhedrin in his own day. He accepts the fact that the Jewish authorities put Jesus to death, interestingly enough. Well, nowadays, of course, we don't say that. Do right, but he, in effect, is saying because he claimed to be the Messiah and was a false Messiah and was a heretic, they put him to death. He doesn't okay? say about not, him being, not being from the house of David. Uh, I, think you're gonna, I think you can assume yeah, that he doesn't believe it. Let's see what he writes. Yeah. I'm waiting with patience. Yeah, go on. <laughs> For has there ever been a greater stumbling than this? All the prophets affirmed that the Messiah would redeem Israel, save them, gather their dispersed, and confirm the commandments. But he caused Israel to be destroyed by the sword, mm -hmm. their remnants to be dispersed, and humiliated. He was instrumental in changing the Torah and causing the world to err, serving another besides God. In other words, he doesn't consider Christianity to be a monotheistic religion. Right? Because he knows about the concept of the Trinity. He knows Christian ideas. He's living in a neighborhood where there are Christians. He's not ignorant of Christianity. He knows about the notion of the, uh, of the mass and the host and the transubstantiation. And for him, this is paganism this is or idolatry. Kind of, this is my kind of guy. This okay. Is, he, he's taking them on. He's taking them on. And look what he says. Look what they've done to us. Look what his followers have done to us. He's living in the, cru the age of the Crusades where the Crusaders stormed Jerusalem and massacred every Jew and Muslim they could find. By the way, killed a lot of Christians too because they thought they were Jews or Muslims because of the way they dressed. But the point is, he sees Christianity as bringing this terrible stuff to the world, especially against the Jews. Okay? Changing the Torah? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Saying you don't have to keep kosher anymore. You don't have to circumcise. You don't have to keep the Sabbath. All of those things that Paul really was responsible for. As we know, Jesus was a good, observant Jew. Um, he is saying, look at all the terrible things that Jesus did. Right? But it is beyond the human mind to fathom the designs of the Creator. For our ways are not His ways, neither are our thoughts His thoughts. All this matter regarding relating to Jesus of Nazareth and the Ishmaelite Muhammad who came after Him only served to clear the way for the King Messiah, to prepare the whole world to worship God with one accord, as it is written, for I will turn to the people a, a pure language, that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. The word really in Hebrew is accord. Okay, so what is he saying? And by the way, in his, in his epistle to Yemen, he refers to Muhammad as a madman, by the way. Um, what is he saying here, interestingly enough? How is it clear the way? He's saying this is preparing all of these false things, and the, preparing us for the... Why? Through one? The, the, the mayhem that has been created by these two 
do, does not preclude the coming of good times. No, he's going further than that. He's saying, in effect, although they are really, and by the way, he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't condemn Islam as much as he does Christianity for obvious reasons. Muslims don't use statues. They, you know, in other words, they may be mistaken, but they're not like Christians, right? He's in effect saying, yeah, they do worship our God. They use our Bible. They worship our God. They, they're obviously wrong on a lot of things. But by spreading even, you might call, defective monotheism, they are preparing the way because they're getting rid of paganism and idolatry. They're getting rid of pagan religion. They've spread to the Gentiles the knowledge of the God of Israel. Ooh, they, Christians and Muslims, even if they're, nice. if they're not nice. doing it in the right way, they are part of the, the... In other words, he's saying, for some reason, this is the way God intended the Messianic age to eventually arrive. In other words, he sees an evolution of humanity towards the Messianic age, which is, of course, a very Jewish idea that the future will move to that. Um, and Christianity and Islam are part of the process. Even if they are defective, and even if they've caused us all this grief, they are part of the process because how else are you going to explain it? Well, but, but this, as I see it, this is saying uh, they're preparing the world to worship God with one accord. Yes. So that, all, so that everyone will be Jewish? No, everyone will be minimally worshiping God in the right way, they will become like the righteous Gentiles, right? They'll stop all their nonsense uh, that they do, and we'll read on, read the rest of it. Thus the Messianic hope... You said there were two things. One was they have no longer worshipped idols, and there was something else you said. Well, there are seven things that they... that um, The seven laws of the children of Noah is that they, they accept... God as the one God, they become monotheists, they don't worship idols anymore, they don't eat flesh from a living animal. It's, it's in, in an earlier text that we looked at, briefly looked at. There's a series of things that if people do it, they are now, and he thinks eventually all Gentiles will become like that. But read on, Robert, read, read the rest of it. Thus, the Messianic hope, the Torah, and the commandments have become familiar topics, topics of conversation amongst the inhabitants of the far isles and many peoples, uncircumcised of heart and flesh. They are discussing these matters in the commandments of the Torah. Some say those commandments were true, but have lost their validity and are no longer binding. That's Christians, right? Others declare that they are an esoteric they meaning. They had, an, had an esoteric meaning and were not intended to be taken literally. That the Messiah had already come and reveal their occult significance. That's also a form of, in other words, these are what Christians do with the, the many of the laws of the Torah. Go on. But when the true King Messiah will appear and succeed, be exalted and lifted up, they will forthwith recant and realize that they have inherited naught but lies from their fathers, that their prophets and forebears led them astray. Yes! So, yes, he's okay. saying that. He says, and this is really interesting, he says, you know, Christians are reading our Bible, they're talking about our texts, they may get it wrong, but it's part of their conversation, and even, to a certain extent, Muslims are doing the same thing, right? And this will clear the way, ultimately, for them to see the truth. It's, you know, there were... Um, uh, Jewish scholars in uh, the, the following century who were not as hard on Christianity as uh, uh, Maimonides was um, because they were living in Christian societies. Um, but, um, you know, he, again, if you read, we should read the Epistle to Yemen. Um, he talks there also about Christianity and Islam and not in, not in a very good way. Within the context of the Middle Ages, by the way, um, you know, everybody was in competition with other and they didn't hold back in what they talked about each other. Jews despite their precarious status, amongst themselves said some really, you know, harsh stuff about Christianity and Islam. You know, so that's what, now you know why this was censored out, <laughs> right? Especially when this was printed in Christian countries, where, you know? And you, and you have no doubt that it was not self-censored. Not self-censored, no.
because there were Christian con uh, Jewish converts to Christianity who could read this stuff and could go tell the Christian authorities, do you know what's in here? Mm -hmm. And as a result, also from the printed editions of the Talmud, there were all the references to Jesus were, kicked, were edited out. We know that they were there because we have one complete manuscript of the, of the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud from the Middle Ages, the Munich manuscript. So we know what all the parts that were censored out are. So, you know, there's several dozen references to Jesus in the Talmud that in the printed editions of the Talmud, up until recently, were censored out. And when you look, for example, at the title page of most Jewish printed books, right, the stamp of the censor is there, the Christian censor. Forgive me for being a little bit skeptical, but if you knew that, this, that the censor was going to come along, read it and stamp it, and you knew what you were about to print, you might decide that you weren't going to print it well, because you didn't want to publish it. Well, the printers were not independent. The printers had to, uh, in those days, printers, before they could print a book, had to get a permission from the authorities to print the book. Uh, now, again, there were some things that were probably self-censored, maybe the, but a lot of it was from the outside. Okay, so there we are. There's our a year long, uh, long 16 weeks ultimately study of Maimonides. I hope you got a much better idea of who he was. Um, just to go back to the beginning, I first started studying him as an undergraduate. This is my copy from my undergraduate.